Yes, I appreciate that wonderful song, and thank you so much for being here today, and we hope that the Lord will bless you through the services. Many of you may not know, but the world record for the bench press is 885 pounds. Now, some of you, that may not mean a whole lot, but a bench press is where you lay down on a bench, and obviously you take the bar, the big bar, and you take it off of its rack, bring it down to your chest, and then push it back up uh, to extend your arms. 885 pounds. Now, what if I were to tell you that I've been training with a professional trainer, and I've been working hard for the last year, and I can bench press the world record 885 pounds. No, no, for real, I can. I've been working on it and working on it. I've uh, been taking supplements, been doing a lot of things. And what if, what if I were to continue to tell you this every Sunday and every Wednesday and every message that I preach, I just keep continually saying this and saying this and saying this. Some of y'all, because you believe your preacher, would believe me. Some of y'all, and we already know who it would be, would say, Pastor, prove it. And as a matter of fact, some of you would go so far as to probably bring a bench up here with the weights and say, all right, preacher, let's see it. Amen? Because when somebody claims to be able to do something that is outlandish like that, which it is very outlandish. If I could bench press 200 pounds, I would be impressed with myself. When someone continues to claim over and over again that they can do something uh, miraculous or outlandish like that, then someone somewhere is eventually going to stand up and say, prove it. We want to see it. And that's exactly what happened in our text today with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, as we continue on our Sunday morning journey through the life of Christ, entitled, That I May Know Him, we find in our scripture today in Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, the gospel of Mark chapter 2, that the Lord is put to the test. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says this, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. Now, in order to understand the text and the scripture today, you need to understand how a uh, New Testament or in the time of the first century, in the times of Jesus, how the houses were built because they weren't built the way that our houses are built. Uh, they didn't have two-story with a pool in the back and a three-car garage. And you say, my house is not built like that either. Mine's not either. Uh, but that's the way we build our houses today. Now, in the New Testament times, a house was built uh, mostly out of mud and, and, and mortar and different kinds of bricks and different things like that, but it was very, very uh, straight. It was a straight line. There wasn't all this uh, fancy architecture and all these roof pitches and all this kind of stuff. There was basically on the average middle class, you know, someone that had uh, somewhat of wealth but not uh, opulence, their house would be kind of a flat front uh, to the street or whatever uh, way they would get in, there would be one door in the front, and then as you went through that uh, greeting area, it was a kind of a foyer almost, like we have in the church, where all the businessmen and different people, whatever their business was, they would meet in that front room. Uh, a lot of the reason was because they didn't want any strangers or business people to come in and see their family, their wife or their daughters or their kids. And so they had this business foyer, front room, that would have one door off of the street. You go through that area, and then they would have a courtyard in the middle of the house. And from the courtyard, all the bedrooms would have their doors. 
And so this is the kind of house we believe possibly that in Capernaum as uh, Jesus' headquarters, that it could have even been Peter's house that this occurrence happened uh, on this day. We don't know for sure, but uh, Peter would have had an uh, upper middle class house being the owner of a fishing business. And so as we enter into this house, you can understand that Jesus, of course, would not have met and taught in that small foyer front room. He would have been in the courtyard in the center of the house that would have been the largest area. And then all the people could have had the doors open to the various bedrooms. They also could have had that front door uh, open. And they could have all heard what Jesus was teaching as he would teach in one corner of that courtyard. Now, they have flat roofs on their houses back then. And uh, basically, they would have a little bit of a wall that went around the roof. And then they would have stairs on the side to get up to the roof. And the average Jewish person back in those days spent a lot of time on their roof because it's the coolest place uh, in the evening, of course. And so as we get an idea, a picture of the house now, we understand that Jesus would have been teaching in the courtyard there. There would have been a whole group of people piled into there, as many as, as could get into that space. There would be people in the front cor- uh, foyer room. There would be people in the bedrooms. And the Bible says that there were so many people that they couldn't even get close to the door, that front door uh, facing the street. And so the whole entire house is packed. And there's no room for anyone to come in to the house. And straightway many were gathered, verse 2, together insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now, what... This word here, palsy, means uh, we still have this word in our medical uh, journals and in medical science. We still use the word palsy. Uh, There is Bell's palsy. There is cerebral palsy. There's all kinds of palsies, and the word just means paralysis, that you are paralyzed from one section uh, uh, or all of your body. Bell's palsy is a paralysis of the face. Uh, Cerebral palsy is a a paralysis or being paralyzed for part of your brain. There are many different kinds of palsies. And this man, the Bible doesn't tell us what kind he had, but we're assuming because these four men had to carry him in a bed that he must have been paralyzed from the waist down at least because that's why he couldn't walk and walk on his own accord to go to this meeting where Jesus was teaching in the house. And so we don't know exactly what kind of palsy he had, but he was paralyzed. Of some way, maybe even from the neck down, uh, he could not move. And so he was able uh, to be brought to Jesus by these four men that were bearing him, the Bible says. They were bore, he was bore of four. What does that mean? Basically, back then, they didn't have big, giant hospital beds. They didn't have these wonderful uh, collapsible beds and all this kind of stuff that we have today. Basically, what they would do is they'd take two poles... And then they would wrap his blanket around those poles and carry him in like what we would call a cot. And so there's four men, one on each end of the poles, and they're carrying this guy to get him to Jesus. Because they all four, including the paralyzed man, five of them, they all knew that if they could just get him to Jesus, Jesus could heal him. They were all convinced of that. And you're going to see that they were very convinced of that in just a minute. They were under the impression and they were convinced in the deeps of the depths of their heart that if they could just get this guy to Jesus, Jesus would heal him. Not only would he, but he, not only could he, but that he would heal this man. And so when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, now that's not the press, okay? That's not CNN, all right? That is the press of the crowd. The pressure of the crowd that they're exerting on the people that are around them, the press, they uncovered, these four men, they uncovered the roof where he was. Now, many people have read through the scriptures and said, well, how in the world could they have dug up that foot deep of cement or or block or whatever it was? No, 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 no. Understand, Jesus is in the courtyard in the center of the house that a lot of times just had some wood trestles across there, had some uh, tiles or some type of light uh, even sometimes vegetation, sometimes it was grapevines, there was other things that were a roof and a shade over that courtyard. And so these men went over there to that area. They went up the side steps, went up onto the roof, went out over to the courtyard where Jesus was teaching, and they undid whatever light roof there would have been over that courtyard. 
Now, it still made a ruckus. Have you ever, when somebody, some of you did it just now, when the choir or the ensemble was singing or Brother Timothy was playing, some of y'all came into the back door of the auditorium and you kind of stopped right there and you decided whether you're going to come in or not come in and try not to make any noise to disturb. Do you understand how hard it is not to make noise when you're trying not to disturb someone that's teaching or someone that's going uh, uh, interacting with other people, and it's really quiet except for Jesus' voice. There probably wasn't any uh, other noises going on in the area. And here are these four men, and I don't know that they're trying to sneak in, but let me tell you, as soon as they start taking the roof off, as soon as they even got up on the roof, there's four guys carrying another guy all over the roof. And all the people down the underneath are like everybody on Sunday morning. They're trying to listen to the preacher, but there's something going on in the roof. And so they're distracted. And then as soon as they get to taking off the roof so they can let this man down in his bed, can you imagine all of the disturbance that must have been going on? And there's dirt and dust flying down now. Uh, Maybe pieces of wood. If it's a grapevine that's covering the courtyard, maybe some grapes are falling down and hitting people in the head. I don't know what happened. But let me tell you, the teaching session is getting very much disturbed at this point. And maybe even Jesus would stop teaching as being the great teacher that he was. He wouldn't teach necessarily when everybody was distracted. And so as they get the roof uncovered, and you know, I don't know how big this guy was. You know, if he was really tall and, and you know, amazingly built like me, it wouldn't have took that much space out of the roof. If he was built like some of y'all, they'd have had to take the whole roof off because you're so tall. If, no matter how big he was, they would have had to make a pretty big size hole in this roof. They're also standing up there somehow with ropes. Now, I don't know, how do you, how do you come to the teaching session of Jesus, the Jesus preaching meeting with ropes and everything? These guys were ready. You know, they can't just take the guy. Just drop him down from the roof on the ground. They had to have found something or they had to have brought something to lower him down. You know, can you see it? Everybody, oh, oh, inch him down, inch him down. Oh, wait, wait, stop. You're going too fast. So somehow they brought ropes or they found something to lower him down. And here now the whole crowd's got to be watching by now. You can't tell me that they're, they're still teaching and there's still some people that are just paying attention to Jesus. No, no, no. Everybody's watching now. And they lower him right down in front of Jesus, right down onto the ground. And now watch what Jesus does. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, who's they? The four guys up on the roof that are lowering him down and the guy in the bed. Their faith, the collective faith of all five of those men. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, wait a minute. That's not what they came for. They came so that this young man or or middle-aged man, however old he was, so that he could get healed. But now, if you understand the Jewish culture, This young man, or whoever he was, this paralyzed man, when he was lowered down, and even when he was brought to the meeting to be healed by Jesus, in the back of his mind, because of the Jewish teaching and because of their culture, he would have thought most of the time, I don't think I can be healed. I have got way too many sins in my life for any prophet of God to heal me. That was the prevailing attitude and the thought in those days. If you are a terrible sinner, God will not perform a miracle for you. That was the Jewish thought. And so we don't know to what extent that was permeating the mind of this man. But let me tell you, Jesus does. Jesus knew exactly what was on his mind. And Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. And so he comes to the man and says, nothing about healing, but says, son, your sins are all forgiven. Now, I don't know what the paralyzed man felt, but I know what I felt when the Lord told me, son, your sins are all forgiven. I got a little excited. And I hope that you did too when you got saved. 
So here he is, and he says to this young man, to the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, he has just made an outlandish claim. Now, think about it. Anybody can come along and say, Brother Robert, your sins are all forgiven. I just deem it so. How are you going to know if it happened? You know, it's like a lot of these faith healers. They get up there with somebody and say, oh, you have a tumor on your brain. (laughs) Pow, it's healed. Well, how do we know? We don't know if that person had a tumor on their brain or not. Now, if we see some MRIs, and then we go back and see some new MRIs, and we see that the tumor is gone, then I might believe. So anybody, church, can stand up and say, your sins are all forgiven. But then somebody is going to come along and say, prove it. And that's where the scribes fit in. Verse 6. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak bla- thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, these guys are not wrong. They're not wrong in what they're thinking. They probably got a bad attitude about it. But they're not wrong in what they're thinking. They have studied. They're the scribes. They have studied the entire Old Testament front to back. They know it by uh, better than any of us do today. They know that in the book of Isaiah, God said, I and I alone can forgive sin. So they're not wrong in what they're thinking. But notice what Jesus says. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk? Now think about this for a minute. You say, Wait a minute. It doesn't sound like that's the same thing. Let me tell you, in the front of a crowd of people that are all gathered, just watched a sick of the palsy, a person, paralyzed person, be lowered down to the feet of Jesus right in the middle of a teaching session, it's a whole lot easier, really, to say, Buddy, sins are forgiven, than it is to say, Arise, take thy bed, and walk. Because when you say, Arise, take thy bed, and walk, everybody's going to expect him to get up and walk. If I say your sins are forgiven, how do we know if it happened or not? So Jesus says, what do you think, scribes? Which is easier for me to say? Thy sins be forgiven or arise, take up thy bed and walk? Notice verse 10. This is our text. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy. I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Now, contrary to what would happen if you asked me to prove the fact that I can bench press 885 pounds, when the scribes basically inferred to Jesus We need some proof. Jesus said, I will heal this paralyzed man so that you know, there's no doubt in your mind, that Jesus has the ability to forgive sins. It was the proof. Anybody can come along and say your sins are forgiven. But Jesus said, not only are your sins forgiven, but arise, take up your bed and walk. And the man took up his bed and he walked out of there. He didn't need the four friends anymore because now he's not paralyzed anymore. Now, everybody in those days understood that if you come in Jesus or in God's name and you try to do miracles, God will not give miracle power to somebody that's a sinner or a liar. 
Now, yes, the devil, yes, sorcerers, yes, the people of dark magic and black magic, all those things, yes, they can do miracles in the power of Satan. But everybody in the New Testament knew if you come to claim that you are a man of God and that you're doing a miracle in the power and in the name of God, the Jehovah of the Bible, God will not bless or give miracle power to people that are sinners and that are deceiving other people. They all knew that. So when Jesus performed the miracle and he said right at the outset, this is to prove to you that I can forgive sins, and he did the miracle, God blessed. You remember the the young man that was healed and they hauled his parents into the synagogue and they were asking all these questions about how he got healed. They asked him two or three times, how'd you get healed? How'd you get healed? He said, I don't know. He said, all I know is I was blind and now I see. But let me tell you, I don't think even this guy knew better than that. He said, I don't think that God would hear sinners to provide miracles in his name. And so this was a humongous proof to these scribes and everybody in this crowd that Jesus does really have the power to forgive sin. And can I echo it again today, this morning? Jesus can forgive you of your sins. If you think about it, you know, people get hung up on whether it's past, present, future sins. Was it all the sins? Was it part of the sins? Listen, all, think about this this morning. All of my sins were future sins when Jesus died on the cross. I hadn't even been born yet. And so, of course, Jesus can forgive all your past, present, and future sins. And he really can. He's not just saying that. This morning, if you come to Jesus, he can totally and utterly forgive you of all your sins. Every time that you've lied, every bad attitude, every anger, moment of anger, every moment of outburst, every bad thought, everything that you've done that you've been covetous and and you've been deceptive and, and all these different bad attitudes and the times when you haven't loved other people the way you should and on and on and on, the drug abuse, the pornography, the alcohol, whatever sins that you've committed in your life, Jesus can forgive them all. He can forgive them all. Matter of fact, he told us through John the Beloved in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says in Psalms 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. You see, Jesus really does have the power to forgive your sins. It's not something we just get up here and say. I didn't go to some course or some clinic and say, look, now, preacher, what you need to do every Sunday morning, you got to get up there and tell them. Now, try to convince them that Jesus can forgive their sins. No, 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 brother. Jesus really can forgive you of your sins, and he proved it. You see, a, if you want to call it on a scale of miracles, a smaller miracle was raising the man from his paralyzed state and letting him walk out. The grand miracle was the resurrection. And since Jesus hung on the cross paying the price for all of your past, present, and future sins, and he declared on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus was forgiving you of your sins there on the cross. He was paying the price for them. He was giving you mercy and grace. And some sat around even at that moment when he was dying for us on the cross in our place for our sins. Even in that moment, some people were scoffing and mocking him. And it's almost as if Jesus said, just wait. That you may know that I have the power to forgive sins. Come on over to the grave on resurrection day. Because I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to have new life inside of me. I'm not going to stay dead. I'm going to rise from the dead. And it is the proof, church, that Jesus truly can forgive your sins. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. 
Ephesians chapter 1. Now, don't get bothered this morning because I'm going to read and deal with quite a lengthy text of Scripture here, but we're going to move through it real quickly. Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, that's what we're trying to do through this series on Sunday morning. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. There it is. There's your proof. Jesus can forgive your sins, and he has for most of us, I hope this morning, If you've been biblically saved, he can forgive you of your sins. He's not just saying it. He's not just talking about it. He can do it because God raised him from the dead. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now think for just a second. Would you stop and ponder something for me? Would God, the Father, allow Jesus Christ to sit at his right hand and lift his name above all other names, give him more power, more principality, more authority over the world and over the universe than anyone else that's ever been created or ever existed, would God the Father do that to a charlatan? No, sir. No, he would not. Would he allow a liar and a deceiver to sit on his right hand? No, he would not. And so since the resurrection proved that Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do, God the Father has placed him at his right hand and put his name above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And don't stop there. You know, in the original writings of the New Testament and Old Testament, there weren't any chapters and verses. It just kept on going. And you, verse 1 of chapter 2, you hath he quickened. He's made you alive, too, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now what's Paul saying here in the book of Ephesians? He's saying, hey, before the Holy Spirit and before Jesus Christ, God the Father came in and quickened you and made you alive spiritually and gave you salvation and the Holy Spirit moved inside of you and, and took up residence in your soul. That day before that, you were dead. You were a sinner. You were just like everybody else. You were living this life for yourself. You were selfish. You were fleshly. You were a sinner. You were terrible. You were awful. Verse 4, but God, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, wait a minute. At the moment of my salvation, my reservations and my seat and myself, because I was baptized into what Jesus did on the cross, I am sitting right now. You can't tell. It don't look like it. But I'm sitting in heavenly places right now. My citizenship is not here on this old ugly earth. I belong up there. 
That's where I'm a citizen of. And would God the Father, now let's ponder just again. I know it's, it's really taxing. This is twice or two or three times now that I've asked you to think this morning. I know it's tough. But I want to ask you the same question that I asked of Jesus a minute ago. Would God the Father allow you to sit in heavenly places if your sins had not been forgiven? No, he would not. That in the ages to come, this is what it's all about. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Can I encourage you, church, this morning? What you believe about Jesus is correct. He's proved it. He said That if you would come to him, repenting of your sins, believing in him only for your salvation and your eternal destiny, he has promised us over and over in the word of God that if you would come and repent of your sins and look to what he did on the cross of Calvary, believe in your heart that he can forgive you of sins, he will forgive you of those sins this morning and he will give you eternal life. And Jesus proved it. Now, I'm going to recall, or use an old word, I'm going to recant. It was just illustrated purposes anyway. I can't bench press 885 pounds, so don't go by it. Nobody go out to lunch telling everybody that, okay? And I certainly can't prove it. But Jesus said in verse 10 of our text that he was going to prove that he could forgive the paralyzed man's sins, and then he raised him up to walk. Not only that, but God the Father raised up Jesus because he was able to do what he said he was able to do in forgiving our sins, and he is who he said he was. And not only that, but in order to prove it, he's raised you up too. You see, you had a bad sin problem. It was worse than being paralyzed. It was eternal. And God reached down and touched you and said, yes, Jesus can forgive sins. And I'll tell you what, he'll forgive your sins. And when I was eight years old, he forgave all of my sins. Every single last dirty one of them. And he's proving it because right now you can't tell. But I'm sitting in heavenly places. And every morning and every evening, I get a chance by the precious blood of Jesus Christ to walk directly into the throne room of God and bring my prayer request to an almighty, universe-creating God. There's your proof, church. If you've had doubts, if maybe your faith has failed you at moments in your life, there's the proof. Jesus said... He can forgive you of your sins, and he proved that he can. Now, here's my challenge to you this morning. If you have never come to Jesus Christ and asked him to forgive you of your sins, believing that he could, and you've never dealt with what he did on the cross of Calvary in your place and in mine, to pay the price for your sins, that's why he died on the cross. If you've never had a moment where you put your full faith, everything about your being, you placed it into Jesus for your eternal destiny and for your entrance into heaven. If you have not done that this morning, can I echo what Jesus said? Jesus can forgive you of your sins if you'll just come and ask him, believing that he will. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we love you today, and God, we're so grateful that you sent your only begotten Son to live a perfect, sinless life here on this earth. And Lord, that you allowed him, and not only allowed him, but he volunteered to come and pay the price for our sins on the cross of Calvary, taking all of God the Father's wrath on him. All of the judgment for all of our sins was placed on Jesus. 
And Lord, he paid the price, and it's paid in full. And all we have to do is believe and come and ask you to forgive us of our sins, repent of those sins, and put our full faith and trust in you, and you will save us this morning. You've done it millions and millions of times, and you can do it again today. Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know for sure that they're on their way to heaven, maybe they've gotten so confused with all these churches and all these preachers and all this religion and all these things that they've experienced in their life, they have no real sure idea if when they pass from this life to the next that they're really going to go to heaven. They don't know for sure. But would you give them the courage to step out this morning and come down to this altar and meet with one of our counselors and Lord, one of our counselors will take them out in private, in a place in private, and show them from the Word of God how they can know for sure that their sins are forgiven and that they have eternal life because you not only said it, but you proved it. Would you help us today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.